Well, good morning. Um, and I'd like to thank the organizers for having us come and, and speak to you on this topic. It's a topic, uh, it's an area that we've been working on for uh, a little while, um, and we're very excited about it because we, we have some news to share with everyone um, and bringing you on some updates of what's happening with the partnership and w where we're going to go on this. And again, I'd just like to reiterate, the reason that um, we're speaking together and that the talk has been joined is the fact that this is clearly a true partnership. This is something that we've been working on together um, for a year and a half now, over maybe over two, well, maybe over that time, maybe two years. But but it's it'll become very clear to you that this is something that we do together as a partnership. It isn't that I do my little work on my area and, and involve the USDA and that and that Allison works with LC and we also have other partners. But the fact is, we we are constantly talking with each other. We are putting the work together. We are constantly going back and forth to see what benefits both sides and what's going to benefit the public health for the U.S. So um, we were both asked to speak and when we saw that both of us were going to be on the agenda we said this is a perfect way of bringing together this talk to really show how we're working together on this issue. Um, first slide. I'm just going to give you just a little bit of history um, going back a little bit. Um, as you know that uh, we're going to be talking about the USDA Nutrient Data Bank, data, Database which has been around for a number of years in the format that you all know it as, but really this database was started over a hundred years ago by Dr. Atwater. He was the U.S. Department of Agriculture's first chief of nutrition investigations, and he's widely regarded as the father of modern nutrition research and education. In his early career, he made the first modern analysis of food in the United States, and while that food was actually feed corn, so it wasn't for human <laughs> consumption, but it was important for human consumption because it went in to feed the life, uh, livestock of animals that we actually then did consume. Um, but it was the beginning of a really incredible career for him in nutrition. And his food tables, which he started way back then, and this was over 100 years ago, um, were the basis for our nutrient um, and values of foods, and there's the basis that we actually use today, um, although we're not still using them in paper card file forms. We have actually have it as a, an electronic database, and you actually can pull it up on your smartphones now. So we've made significant progress since his time, but I just wanted to acknowledge that he was the one who really started this whole area. Um, we are going to be talking about the, the National Nutrient Database. I am not going to give you an awful lot of information about the database per se because Pamela Pearson is going to be speaking to you later. She's the leader of that laboratory group and that database and she has extensive knowledge and will be able to fill you in on all kinds of aspects that are going on with the database. So I'm only going to talk to it in respect to how we're using it in terms of this public-private partnership. As you know, though, there are a couple things I do want to mention is why did we start with a partnership using this database? It is the gold standard for food compositional data. Many of you know that it provides the foundation for many of the other databases that we use, in, in particular nutrient values for what we eat in America, the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey, lovingly known as NHANES by I think everyone in the room. It also provides the nutrient um, values and composition for therapeutic, clinical, and research databases. It, it also provides it for food frequency questionnaires and for product development, labeling, and regulation. So it has an extensive um, output in terms of the reach and the use and, and who makes use of this. So it's an actually perfect place to start for one of our public-private partnerships. And before we go into um, too much of what this particular private par public private partnership is. I wanted to say a couple things, and, and Dr. Watecki was very modest, but Dr. Watecki was the one who really launched this whole air arena of, of making the public private partnership something that the USDA was going to really focus on. And she did it in a way that really she engaged a huge number of people in to get this launched. And the first one they decided to work on was the, uh, the branded foods database. So a lot of our um, success in this area has got to go to Dr. Watecki for really making us start with this area. 
One of the things that came out of this is there was a paper that was put together and, and released a year ago, and it talks about the principles of the public-private partnerships. I've given you the source on the bottom of the, um, of the page. This is a critical paper for looking at. Anyone who wants to engage in a public-private partnership really needs to read this paper because it would really examine all of the things that are going to be necessary to have in a public-private partnership. There are 12 principles. I'm not going to read every one of them. There are six on this slide and there are six on the following slide. But I def definitely want to tell you that the number one is to clearly have a doable goal and a goal that is in that everybody who is part of this partnership is really vested in. And make that goal uh, be one that is a common one to the partners. If you start out with a goal for one group, which isn't the goal for another group, and you try to have a partnership there, it just doesn't work out. So that's critically important. Um, you can read through the rest of these. The other one I want to mention in particular is goal number four. And, and it's a clear statement of work rules and partners' roles, responsibilities, and accountability and to build in trust. And we heard that bef earlier this morning from our original speaker. And we have to have transparency and mutual respect in, in the operating principles. These are absolutely essential. We have to have open communications and clear discussions back and forth between the partners. Um, I don't want to go into details, but if there, there were situations where we had a few stumbling blocks along the way, where we didn't have things as open and clear as we really needed them to be. Um, if those of you are interested, I can give you some ideas of what not to do, but for, from here, you know, I'll do that privately. Um, for right now, I'd just like to talk about actually moving forward and how the partnership actually did develop and the way that it worked. So these are the first six principles. These are the next six principles that you have to have. And so any, again, I can't stress strongly enough, anyone interested in public-private partnerships, please go and pull this paper and make sure you commit to these because they're absolutely essential for doing that. And, and Dr. Wateki, thank you for pushing us in this direction. <laughs> Um, as, as Dr. Oteka mentioned, we did decide to start the partnership for public health um, with the USDA branded foods product database. And the goal is to improve public health and the sharing of open data, um, as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Oteki. So what we had was we had the ability to bring in private data uh, information into this public database. The data will be publicly available by federal agencies for the research community, international databases, proprietary databases, and end users, and the food industry. And we launched this initially, and we did it through what we call a beta test process. And I think that's another lesson learned that is really important as you start to begin a public-private partnership. It's, it would probably be very, very useful to build in a beta test process so that you can get things started, try a little bit, do a little experimentation with it, and then be able to go back and look at the way it was put together and what things worked and what things didn't work. So we actually launched into a beta test with three partners originally, and the partners were the USDA, ILSI North America, and the ATIP Foundation. Um, this is the, the database. When you would, uh, many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with this web page. But when you go to the database, you you go into um, the USDA net, the nutrient database for standard reference. So this is where we're building our uh, public-private partnership, and using this database. Excuse me. Just want to make sure I cover every comment that I need to. Um, and. Um, the, so anyway, so you're probably very familiar with this. It's the composition of the food supply and the consumer dietary choices are key inputs for agriculture and, and food policy decisions. And this actually requires a comprehensive food composition database. But the volume and fluidity of the branded and private food labels projects in the U.S. marketplace are key challenges to the robustness of such data. So in, in terms of what, what this means is this database has been sitting there. It has had about 8,000 items 
um, which is a significant number of items to have in your database. But as we all know, there are a significant number of more items that are out there. And we plan to expand this to, uh, I'm going to leave some of this for Allison to talk about, but the number is going to grow substantially over that. And the reason being is that what we want to provide for all sets of people out there, whether you're just a, an average person who wants to know about food items, whether you're a research that needs to know what's in the come up and then the components of the foods that folks are eating, um, whether you're interested in making policy, um, whether you're, you know, where you stand out there, this database is going to be very, very useful for you and it's going to have information that puts all of, all of the information that you need in one place so that you can go directly to that database. Um, the, um, that's going to be um, seamless into the standard reference uh, database for the USDA National Nutrient Database. So you will soon be able to go there. Um, what's going to be available? What is going to be included in this database? Well, certainly the parent company, the manufacturers, the, uh, you know, and the private label, that information will be available. Um, it will allow you to know exactly when somebody said they ate a particular thing, you're going to be able to know exactly what was in that item that they consumed. Certainly the nutrient facts panel is going to be on the database. Obviously, we're going to have to have that. It's going to be available as packaged and as prepared. So there's lot, all the information that you're going to need to know about what was consumed. Um, number three, the, the product name and generic descriptor, the four weights and measures, and serving sizes and servings per package are going to be contained in this database. The date stamp is going to be on there, and this is really important so that you know when that item was purchased and consumed, you're going to be able to tell exactly which formulation was going to be used by that, within, used from that product, and be able to know exactly what was, what was consumed by the individuals. Um, the ingredient list and the sub-list, it's in hierarchical, hierarchical and descending order. That is going to be included in the database that you're to be able to go to. Um, it'll allow new analysis, analysis that we've never been able to do before, but you're going to have this all in one place. And the GTIN number, which is a specific nutrient composition directly from the food product itself. So that's all going to be available. This is what, when you go to this database, this is what you're going to be looking at. Um, so, um, the, the, so for the successful branded foods products database, the means which was what we mean by that is the database can be directly linked to specific years of the NHAN survey to more accurately assess data intakes in the U.S. We'll have a historical record of the branded food and private foods label enabling comparisons of current and past consumptions. We'll be able to track changes in the food supply and linked with efforts that foster that change. So you'll be able to go back and look, did a policy make a difference? Were we able to increase uh, the intake of the, the things that we are, are trying to promote in terms of healthy intakes of food? And we'll have a much stronger data needed to inform the public for policy and regulatory decisions. Um, this is the branded foods products database page that when you go to the database, that's what you'll see. And I just want to emphasize down, as you see at the bottom there, that these servings, data, uh, these servings are based on data that is presented from the manufacturers, and the manufacturers are therefore responsible for the data. Um, we anticipate going up over several hundred thousand items into the database fairly soon, and it's not going to be possible for our nutrient data lab to be able to go over and examine every single item that gets into that database. As you can imagine, the work is, would be a tremendous amount. So what we are doing is we're going to rely on the manufacturers to give us the accurate data. And then when the manufacturers see the data on the database, it's up, if they see a problem with it, it's going to be up to them to correct it. Um, Pamela will go into more information about how they do some quality control with things, so I don't want to go into that right now. So there will be some uh, items that will be looked at, but certainly not the hundreds of thousands of items that are going to come in here. So I want to make it really clear that when you go to that database, what you're going to see is the manufacturer supplied information on that. And um, 
We ran the beta test. The beta test ran up through basically last fall. We were able to have the input from some private partners, and Allison is going to talk to you a lot more about that. And this is the, one of the pages that you'll see from the beta test. So you'll see that, for example, there's banquet chicken pot pie, there's Orville Redenbacher's popcorn, there's, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And I've only given you one page as a snapshot, so you'll be able to see what's in there. So it'll be very, uh, obviously you can see there's at least 11 pages there. Um, this data, I've just been told this morning, will be available probably by the end of this meeting. So you will be able to go into the database and pull up the um, beta tested material um, and be able to view that. So we're really excited. It's the first time we've been able to tell you when it's going to be available on the website. And uh, Pamela Pearson's group is working extremely hard at making sure that that comes out, um, hopefully by the end of this conference. Now, as I said, this is a partnership that we worked with in terms of our public side, wanting to get data out to everyone possible um, and for the benefit of, of the public health. And we work very closely with ILSI North America, who brought to us the private side. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Allison uh, Kretzer, who is going to represent the, the private side and give you the information of what they did and the contributions they made to make sure that this all got into the database. And then um, we'll, we'll talk afterward. Thanks. So good morning. Um, I'm going to turn to the next slide to tell you about the beta test that took place um, from November 2014 through March of 2015 um, of last year. And um, just ILSI is the International Life Science Institute, and the North America branch is where I reside. And we are a nonprofit scientific foundation. Our members are made up largely of the food and beverage industry as well as the ag um, industry. And so we had members that from the beginning when we were talking about this public-private partnership really said to us, as we look at trying to gather this information, we strongly suggest you work with GS1. So of course my response was, who is GS1? And so this began um, our journey in bringing to fruition the USDA branded food products database. And the unique role of GS1 is that it is a global nonprofit organization. It too is user driven as the GS1 community, which really decides what are the, and they set standards. Where you would know them is the UPC code, which was pioneered um, just over 40 years ago. It's now evolved into the G10 number, which you heard from Pam this morning, which allows for more data to be uh, captured within that code. But it is the unique identifier for a branded food product. Um, GS1 is, as I said, global. It's also local. So we are working with uh, GS1 US, but we have GS1 Canada and so forth. It is very much helps to bring the business community together to talk in um, really the language of business. It is once you have standards, everyone is able to uh, understand that information. They help to capture and to share information about products through the food supply chain information and now within the last few years on nutrient information so that it's extremely useful as we look at ways to move forward in, in um, enhancing, expanding um, the USDA National Nutrient Database. As I said, the GS1 is global. Uh, so that was of great interest to us, ILSI North America. We too are global and have branches across the world so that we hope that we can work with our other branches in helping their own countries to begin to adopt once we get this launched within the U.S. And that is very much our intent. Um, and so already we'll be able to begin to collaborate. 
So they have 110 member organizations across the globe. As I mentioned, uh, it could be GS1 Mexico, GS1 Canada, and so forth. So for this beta test, um, we had five member companies from ILSI North America that uh, agreed to be part of the beta test. They include Campbell's, Cargill, ConAgra, General Mills, and Red Gold. And so um, we asked, we wanted a whole variety of different types of product categories. This really helped us to learn about some of the unique pieces of a, you know, again, a beverage versus a food, different, all sorts of different things we kind of learned by having a variety of products. Um, within this beta test, we captured 240 different kinds of products. But um, these member, uh, these companies were members of the GS1 community so that they have um, a GS1 certified data pool provider that they already had a contract with. They, that again, this is how they communicate uh, their, through business, um, information on pallet size, all that kind of information. They're used to publishing their data. So new data with ingredient information about that product or nutrient information just got added along with uh, the size of the package and things like that. Um, what we did find was that those within the regulatory nutrition uh, parts of the company had to be introduced to the GS1 uh, folks within their company. They had not had a need to have conversations and so those relationships formed and were built through the beta test. So again, very helpful for companies to begin to see how to gear up to put all of their product information in. So whoever their data pool provider was, that information went off to the cloud. It was then published to the data pool provider, GS1, we were using for the data, uh, for the beta test, and then the data flowed to the USDA, USDA National Nutrient Database standard reference. So this gives you, it's not easy to see, but I just wanted to show you, this is what you'll be able to see um, in the next couple of days when this beta test becomes publicly available, but this is uh, chicken pot pie, and so you have the nutrient information on uh, per rack serving as well as per 100 grams. This was something obviously that was very important to USDA that they wanted to make sure that they would have the information not just on the rack uh, side or the serving size. Um, also with this product, it has the ingredient list based on the filling as well as further down, and again, it's hard to read, but the crust, and so you have that two separate in that respect. So for our beta test, uh, again, that concluded in the spring of 2014, uh, 240 products were included. Uh, those that are highlighted, the nutrients in red, were mandatory. Now this program is voluntary. So a manufacturer does not have to participate. But if you decide you are going to participate, then there is a mandatory list of attributes that must be submitted. Otherwise, you can't pick and choose and say, oh, I'll give you my nutrients, but I won't give you the ingredients. Um, no. And at the GS1 le level, at the uh, data pool provider, there is a quality control check so that all those mandatory nutrients, attributes on ingredients and weights and measures are all provided, otherwise it gets kicked back to the manufacturer before, so that USDA is not having to do that part. Um, what we do, we also, um, you know, the Nutrient Data Lab said, well look, if they want to do, provide nutrients beyond what's on the Nutrition Facts panel, we'd certainly love to get that information. So that's suggested, but it's not required. But we did, through this beta test, get several other nutrients which are shown in the black font. Um, you know, we'll have to see where all that goes as other manufacturers look at what 
say their competitor is providing? Do they then say, well, you know what, maybe we should. So we'll see how that plays out and I look forward to talking to you in the, at the next conference and we'll see where all of it um, lands. So from our beta test learnings, uh, we had, again, we identified which attributes needed to be mandatory versus recommended within the GS1 implementation guide. So again, we had to make sure the standards were already within the GS1 community, which they were. We didn't have to, you know, ask for a new attribute. Um, so we had all of that and pin, you know, narrow, got that all set. Uh, we had the quality control checks uh, were established, so we're set with that piece. And then the USDA uh, National Nutrient Data Lab really began to understand that there wasn't a way that they were going to be able to do the quality control checks to the extent that they had before, because again, uh, based on the data. But I can assure you that it is clearly labeled that this is either computed values from food manufacturers, or if it's analytical data, you will know that if uh, a food manufacturer uh, decides to provide analytical data. Again, that's built into uh, the system. So um, the public-private partnership between USDA, the ATIP Foundation, and LC North America has completed uh, we completed our work after uh, the beta test was concluded in the spring. Um, it was a time that USDA began to look at what had we learned through this process and what they had decisions to make in moving forward to full implementation. During that period, um, as part of the development phase of the public-private partnership, one of our stakeholders uh, came forward and said, you know, there's other ways that perhaps the data also could be submitted, and would you want to look at that? So that was a question USDA uh, was approached on. And so there was a second beta test which took place this past fall um, as the agency was looking at options. And this was through um, a company that you're going to hear much more from later on uh, this morning, Label Insight, which provides an option for manufacturers if they would prefer to submit their data in this manner. And so they submitted a little over 100 uh, products into USDA, again, to see what you know, how do you go about taking that data and getting it into the USDA database. So Label Insight um, is a company that gathers an enormous amount of information around uh, individual products, all the various different attributes far beyond our subset of attributes that we're interested in. Very often they look at so that uh, a retailer or a manufacturer could learn more about their products in the sense on, you know, whether they're, it's a low sodium product or any of those things or country of origin information and so forth. So they've, uh, Label Insight has been working, busy working with manufacturers, retailers that you see some of them up there, as well as trade associations in their initiatives. They've been working closely also with GS1 on some of their initiatives, as well as the federal agencies, the FDA, USDA, and CDC. So this is, uh, gives you um, one of the products that are part of the uh, beta test that took place last fall is Amy's Vegetable Pot Pie. Um, and so again, the unique identifier and the information is all formatted the same and ingredient information. And so this has been incorporated, as uh, Pam told you, um, into the branded food products database. So if you do a search of all the products, you would then bring up all 350. Or if you search, for instance, taking this vegetable pot pie example, you will then also can search it by pot pie that it would then come up with any of the other values that are within the standard reference. So you might have eight products then if you had, and again, 
um, if the, I don't remember if there was a vegetable pot pie as part of the GS1 beta test, but um, they would all come up and you would see them. And again, I'm returning to the slide that Pam had shown earlier um, with the full listing. Uh, so we're looking forward to you working with the data. We're looking forward to hearing from you um, in the nutrition research community, um, you know, comments on the use of the data, things you'd love to have that aren't there yet. But this is our phase one. I think, you know, I stood up and talked to you two years ago at the National Nutrient Data Bank Conference. And so this is very much a learning and iterative process, and we're very excited that it is coming. So Pam is going to finish this up to tell you our timeline and what's happening next, because it's finally coming. And I know many of you keep asking, Allison, where are we? And I keep saying it's coming. But it really is coming. So I'm just going to give you one more slide. And um, basically, I uh, would give you a little bit of update, uh, again, mentioning the fact that we did the beta tests. And again, the beta tests are extremely helpful in helping you identify really what it is that you need to do and maybe some of the things that you don't need to do. So it was really important to have that phase. And it's taken us some time to understand and, and go through the learning process of what we got out of that and what we want to move forward with. But I can say now we are moving forward with the implementation phase. Um, and so this is our timeline that we anticipate that we are in the process of finalizing agreements to go into the implementation phase. Um, and uh, we are working, we are negotiating right now, <laughs> daily, uh, with GS1 US to make sure that we put the correct agreement which identifies exactly what we need to be put into place, but we anticipate all signatures on that to be done before the end of May, so we will be moving forward that. Um, the second thing that you may be interested in is that there's an outreach at GS1 Connect conference on June 2nd in 2016, and all the partners and all of the players, uh, after this agreement's been signed, all the players will be uh, sitting at a, in a panel being able to give you information at that particular time as well. We anticipate the full implementation by July this summer. And what we really want is a full release of the nutrient um, database, the branded foods public-private partnership portion of this by the Godan uh, uh, September meeting that Dr. Watecki talked about earlier. Um, it's, it's somewhat ambitious, but we think now, based on all the lessons learned in the last year, that we'll be able to get this implemented. And we know that there are over 200,000 items which will be part of that first full implementation this summer. So we plan to have a tremendous amount of data flowing into the Nutrient Data Lab. So um, with that, just wanted to update you, give you our, our final, um, hopefully final timeline at the moment. That's one that we're working with now. And uh, we're done with our presentation, so we'll take questions. <laughs>